How many are excited today that they got their breath today? A lot of times we try to figure out what can we do. Homiletics, hermeneutics, apologetics, strongs, concordance, Greek, Hebrews. Amen. But simple ministry is sometimes the best. God gave you your breath today. Now you need to find the reasons to validate why. And I believe it's to lead somebody else to Christ. I believe it's to share the good news that he's soon to return. Amen? Say amen. So I'm excited to be here. I'm blessed. I'm highly favored by Jesus, not by this world. If you saw that video, you saw that the world sometimes can give you pride and ego and self-entitlement and you can be in the world and of the world, but how many know the Bible says that we are in the world, but we are not of the world, amen? The Bible says that we are just passing through. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm just passing through. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm in the right place at the right time with the right people. I know I went too fast. Say, I'm in the right place at the right time with the right people serving the one and only God. I know who I am. I know who I serve. And I serve the King of Kings, amen? Look to your neighbor and say, I serve the king of kings. Well, they say that a church that is alive is worth the drive. So I'm going to turn my back and say, is this church alive? Yeah. Amen. I don't know. I think you're still asleep. I think you're still bummed that the Buckeyes lost. Cleveland's not doing too well. But guess what? Tomorrow will be better. Amen. Look to your neighbor and say, I think that Cleveland will beat Baltimore today. Amen? But even if they don't, tomorrow's going to come. Amen? So all I want to let you know is I'm just so, so blessed to be here. I'm no more anointed, favored, gifted, or blessed than anybody here, but I just make myself available. Sanctuaries, the penitentiaries, recovery homes, juvenile halls, detention camps, sober living homes. Halfway houses. As a matter of fact, we had an amazing event here. Just last Friday, we had a Celebrate Recovery, but we had Thanksgiving dinner. Come on, somebody. And we also had communion. As a matter of fact, if you're from Celebrate Recovery, just stand up real quick and shout Jesus as loud as you can. Jesus. Amen. And so many testimonies. You know what they told me when I first came out here? There's no sinners in Westlake. I said, I know you're wrong because when I look in the mirror, I see one saved by his grace. Amen. But uh, they became my family, an honored guest, and, and this church is full of love. And can you feel it? The church is moving. Revival is happening. People are coming. New people are coming. Because you know what? There's no perfect church because every time there's a church, there's people in it. We're not perfect, but we're on our way. Say we're on our way. So real quick, there was a, a testimony I wanted to share with a fighter that how many know that fighters fight, train all day to fight all night? And a lot of times there's pride, there's ego, there's self-entitlement, but a lot of times there's a love of just competition and wanting to defeat somebody. And uh, it's prehistoric. It's been around forever. It's been around forever. And this one gentleman I fought named Cheyenne, and um, it was a brutal fight. I think it was one of the fights of, of the year. And uh, he ended up fighting the real fight in life because he died of... Lou Gehrig's disease. But when I was uh, nominated into the Bare Knuckles Underground um, Bodyguard Hall of Fame in Burbank at the Martial Arts Museum, I said, I really don't want any honors because you know what? I don't fight that fight anymore. I fight the fight against principalities and strongholds and spiritual high places, spiritual warfare, because what's on the line? People's souls. So why am I breathing? to lead souls into God's kingdom, to reclaim the territory from the enemy and give it back to the king of kings. But I just remember that his mother was so broken, she said to me, you know, Dragon, that was my name back then, she said, my son really wanted that belt. And now he sits 130 pounds on, on a thing of dry ice. And, uh, and, I, and I said to her, uh, I, I understand. And, and uh, he was much more than a champion, much more than a warrior, a soldier, a fighter than I'll ever be. Because he fought the good fight of faith. 
And his um, whole story can be seen on Showtime. It's called A Time to Kill. So uh, in memory of Cheyenne, and then I asked his mom, you know, my mom committed suicide at 58 years old, and died of an overdose. I died inside. Would you like to be my adopted mom? He said, yes. So you see how God can do miracles? He's a miracle worker. He's a way maker, and he's a light in the darkness. Amen. Say amen. But my life was incomplete. See, how many know that we try things out and we just don't come all the way to a success to where we feel that we made it in life? How many know that many are called but few are chosen? If you're chosen, raise your hand. And there's a situation where I knew in my own life that I was having problems. In other words, I did not complete anything. I wasn't complete, even though I was beaten and molested as a child. And, and as a young adult, I became a martial artist. And I went into the cage as a cage fighter, but I was never complete. I was never a world champion. I was never undisputed, undefeated, world champion. It's okay. Ed. I was never that person because it wasn't my plan. See, we make plans, but God orders our steps. And how many know we're on ordered footsteps? So my life was incomplete. How many here feel that their life is incomplete right now? Well, I promise you, when you draw near to God, when you abide in God, when you go all in, your life will become complete. That's when you'll start to get the blessings because you're walking on ordered footsteps. How many know we're walking on ordered footsteps? Confusion, drugs, alcohol, addictions, all the things of this world. How many know we are in the world, but we're not of the world? How many know that no weapon formed against us will prosper? And greater is he that is in the world that is in us. We can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. And we are more than conquerors. And with God, all things are possible. Amen. Say amen. So I'm nothing but a willing, obedient, humble servant. I'm no more anointed, favored, gifted, or blessed than anybody here. I'm just available. And if you are available, God will give you the ability. I'm a nameless, faceless, voiceless vessel drawing any and all to Jesus Christ for such a time as this. And say this with me. Say, if he can do it. Wow, I don't know about that. Say, if he can do it, I can do it. Isn't that a simple message? That's a simple message. So right now, let's just bow our heads and close our eyes in the house of God as we usher in the Holy Spirit before we start this message. Dear Heavenly Father, creator of everyone and everything, Lord of Lord and King above all kings, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this breath. Father, please help the ones that are hurting, that are broken, that are lost, that are addicted, that are confused, the ones that are free but in prison, the ones that are in prison and free. Father, we just ask that you would help the ones that are sick, the ones that don't know who you are, Father, that they might find a relationship with you this very day. And Father, we ask for every angel in heaven standing with their wings folded in compassion, Father, look down upon our situation, Father. Father, that you would be the physician of our mind, the healer of our heart, continue to be the way, the truth, and the life. Father, hide me behind your death, burial, and resurrection of your son, Father. Let these words be anointed by you, Father. Let me get out of the way and let you say what you came to say. And we ask all these things in your precious name. And all God's children said, amen and amen. How many of you have ever had a wake-up call before? Anybody ever had a wake-up call before? Like there was an appointment, there was something you needed to do, and if you didn't set the clock, if you didn't set the alarm, if you didn't set your cell phone nowadays, that you would sleep through it? Maybe some of you are sleeping right now. Come on now. How many know what a wake-up call is? Okay, there's a reason for a wake-up call. And sometimes wake-up calls can be great news. And sometimes they can be troubling news. There was a movie and it said, you know what? Get yourself a nice suit. Get yourself a nice outfit because you're going to be going to a lot of funerals. How many know that we've been going to a lot of funerals? But I have a message for the enemy, and that is you're not welcome here anymore. See, you have no power. You have no authority. The keys have been taken. The battle has been won, and your time is short because we've gone to too many funerals. Amen. And we've lost too many people, amen? But don't we believe there's a place, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears? All old things have passed away. Everything is new again. Don't we believe that no eye can see, no one can imagine, nor it's entered the hearts of men, women, or children what God has prepared for those that love him? So it's a simple message. 
And that is love God with all of your mind, all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. In other words, love your neighbor. Love your enemy. And sometimes the worst enemy is not the one that's standing next to it. It's the one that we allow to live inside of us. Amen? Say amen. So here's the definition of a wake-up call. Something like a wake-up call from a hotel employee to a guest that serves to wake a sleeper. How I many know sometimes we sleep through life? Sometimes we sleep through our calling, what we're anointed, what we're favored, what we're gifted, what we're blessed, what we're chosen to do, and we're just sleeping through it because we really don't believe what God is saying because we don't have a real relationship with God in the intimacy and the privacy of our own humanity. We can't hear his voice. How many know that the most important thing to do is to hear the voice of God? Because we make plans, but he orders our steps. Amen? So... It says that it's something that serves to alert a person of danger or in need. Danger or in need. Now, you might ask yourselves, why do I do what I do? Dean, if you could be so kind as to show a picture up here real quick. And I want to show you why I do what I do. See, as you're looking at this, this is my family, okay? And why I do what I do is not to reach the nations, not to reach all across the world because I can't save anyone. Only Jesus can. And I can't help the world, but I can help the world around me. Amen? And I remember there was a time when I was 135 pounds and talk, talk, talk like this after 20 years of crack cocaine, crystal meth, and alcohol. And that's after doing 35 movies. That's after being one of the pioneers of MMA fighting. That's after all the worldly acclaims and attributes that the world could give you. And I was miserable because I promise you I'm standing here right now that... This world cannot bring you a peace that surpasses all understanding. We all have a, a hole in our heart, and we need to shape it with the love of Jesus. Amen? But I just remember that um, I, was, I was like, the devil was saying, kill yourself and do it quickly. And I was ready to. But there was another voice that said, son, you can die on the floor, you can walk out the door. You can die on the floor, you can walk out the door. I said, well, then let me just die on the floor then. I'm okay with that. He said, fine. But all the generational curses, murder, molestation, child abuse, drug addiction, alcoholism, witchcraft, will have the legal right to continue to exist within your family. I don't know, Dean, if they can keep moving through or there you go. That's uh, my uh, grandson, CJ. And that's my fiance, Victoria. And... <laughs> that's Everly, little Everly. Isn't she beautiful? And that's my godson, Nene. And that's, that is Ileana. <clears throat> so I don't do it for any other reason, but I do it for my family. So you can go to all the places that God sends you to, but if you're not taking care of your own family, you're missing what you've been chosen to do. Amen? So that's why I do what I do is because when I heard that voice, I just wanted to make sure that everybody else heard that same voice because I was like, Lord, I can't do that. I can't allow those generational curses to continue to go into my family. So now I stand here today, 12 years of sobriety and 11 years of ministry with a simple message of I can do it. You can do it. Amen. Look to your neighbor and say, if he can do it, I can do it. So I remember one time I was here, and the Lord told me, he said, son, I'm preparing the land. I'm setting the table, and I'm going to honor the effort. Preparing the land, setting the table, and honoring the effort. And I was preaching all over the place. And how many have ever been mentally, physically, and spiritually sick before? And I got mentally, physically, and spiritually sick. And I was at the Cambria Hotel, and, and I was just feeling like my body was shutting down. And I went to the Women's Reintegration Center, and I preached a message. And they came up to me and said, where are you from? I said, you mean besides my mom? No, see, you've been reading our mail. Everything that we've been struggling with, everything we've been fighting with, everything that we've been asking God about, it was delivered in that message. See, because God will write his message on your heart. Amen? If you have that intimacy with him, he'll write the message on your heart. And I just wanted to share something with you about the intimacy 
with God. See, I want to have that faith. How many want to have that faith that you would just run into a coliseum? Just run laughing and dancing and singing and worshiping. Where does that kind of faith come from? See, I want the kind of faith that Daniel had when he knew he was going to be thrown in the lion's den. But he said, you know what? I don't care what they do to me. I'm going to open up the windows. I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to pray towards Jerusalem. And how many know that they threw him into the lion's den? But Daniel had that kind of faith that he used a lion as a pillow. How many want to use a lion as a pillow? How about the faith that David had? He was out there, but he had the intimacy of hearing God's voice, and he took out his slingshot, and he took out the bear, and he took out the lion. He's playing the flute. But how many knew when Goliath came, he said, I don't want the full armor of man. I need the full armor of God to take out the giant that's in front of me. See, he was fighting a good fight, staying the course, running to win the eternal prize, gathering the fruits of the Spirit. But he knew the intimacy of God's voice. Sometimes when we have a giant in front of us, we have to bring the David out of us. Amen? So that's the kind of faith that I want. But I don't know if I have that kind of faith. Because when it was time for me to sacrifice, when it was time for me to be obedient, when it was time for me to listen, I was on that wide road that leads to destruction. How many know that we need to stay on that narrow, straight road that leads to heaven? How many want to finish strong and hear well done? Come on, say amen. Say, I want to finish strong. And I want to hear well done. Now, there's a man in the Bible in the Old Testament, Genesis 22. It's through 1 through 14. It talks about how he is the father of faith. How would you like that as a nickname? Hey, there goes the father, there goes the mother of faith, amen? Because he had a relationship with God. God called him his friend. How many know that God calls us his friend? How many know that we are fearfully and wonderfully made? We're created in his image, and he calls us his friend. That's amazing to me. That the creators of heaven and earth, the one that sent his son to die for our sins, that defeated sin and death, calls us his friend. That we're created in his image. Amen. So let me just paint this picture. We're in the Old Testament. Okay, some of the things that have happened is the fall of Adam and Eve. The flood and Noah. And the Tower of Babel. All this is going on. But God is raising up a father of faith. It has a relationship with him. His name is Abraham. And Abraham was a good shepherd. And they had so much intimacy. How many want to hear from God, even today, even right now as we're sitting in our seat, a promise, a covenant, something that God says, I chose you for this. See, many are called, but few are chosen. You are chosen to do mighty things in your life. You are chosen to preach the good news of the gospel. You are chosen to raise your family strong. To be a witness, to be a light to your community, to your family, and to your enemy. You are chosen. And he said to Abraham, he says, here's what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to give you all of the sand on the seashore. And I'm going to give you all the descendants like the stars in the sky. How many would like to hear that? All the sands on the seashore and all the descendants in the sky. Not once, Papa, but three times he says it. Three times. It made me thought of Jesus in the garden when he said, Father, take this cup from me. Not once, but three times. And he said, not thy will be done, but my will. No, he said, not my will, but thy will will be done for each and every one of us. Isn't that something to get excited about? I don't know about you, but I put my hands together with something like that. So Abraham knew that God was not about to lie. That it was impossible for him to lie. And even when we're disobedient, he is obedient to keep his promises. Amen? So he told Abraham, you're going to have all these descendants. Now Abraham was up there in age. And he was trying desperately to have a child with Sarah. But Sarah could not deliver a child. In other words, she could not deliver the chosen child into the arms of Abraham to carry on the legacy. How many know in the Old Testament that was important? Even today, isn't that not important? How many have children here? How many would do anything for their children? Take a speeding bullet for their children. 
take on an incurable disease for their children. No, I cannot give up my child. I'll give up myself before I would give up my child. How many people are like that? Because of their apple of your eye. Because they're created in your image. And we're created in the image of God. We're fearfully and we're wonderfully made. He knew us before the foundations of this world. He knew us before we were in our mother's womb. That's very intimate dialogue that's in the Bible. But how many know sometimes, even though we're a friend of God, even though we know his voice, we can be disobedient. We can go the other direction. He said, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. If you abide in me, I will abide in you. It's a promise. God meets us where we're at. He takes us where we need to be. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Ever. And I have all these people that come up to me. Oh, but I'm a drug addict. I'm an alcoholic. Oh, but I do this and oh, but I do that. I said, but God loves you anyway. If you confess your sins unto him, he is faithful and just to forgive you of all sins. He makes the choice to remember them no more. Unto cleanliness. How many know that we are new creatures in Christ? Amen. So now he's given Abraham this promise. Abraham cannot have a child. So I'm sure he's probably upset with God. He might even be angry with God. But he's not going to say that to God because he knows that God already knows what his heart is feeling. See, God doesn't listen to what we say. He hears the heart. The Bible says on the outside we are wasting away, but on the inside we're being renewed day by day. How many are being renewed day by day? I don't hear you. How many are being renewed day by day? Amen, amen. Don't let me say, here you go, brownies, here you go. Here you go, one whoop whoop. How about, save me, Jesus, save me. Save me, Jesus, save me. Save me, Jesus, save me. There we go. I just want to make sure you're alive, that's all. I'm going to get out the compact mirror in a minute. Make sure there's still breath coming from the, no, just kidding. So here we are. Abraham is wondering, why can't Sarah get pregnant? Now, Sarah says to Abraham, sleep with Hagar. Because she loved Abraham that much, and she wanted a child that much. She needed something for unification, for love, for peace, for joy, for laughter. And she said, just sleep with Hagar. And you know what? Hagar had a child. The child's name was Ishmael, which means the wild one. The wild one. But how many know that God is not one to lie? He keeps his promises. So at an age of 100 years old, Abraham and Sarah was around 90. She had a child, a miracle child. And Abraham and Sarah loved this child like no other. How many love their children? They did everything with Isaac. It was the apple of his eye. But life happens. Ishmael is about 14 years old, and he sees the new birth of Isaac, and he's mocking. How many have ever mocked God before? Come on. Mocked him. Didn't believe in him. Was angry at him. Maybe even yelled at God. But you know what's amazing? Is that God loves us anyway. And if you're angry or upset at God, that means you believe in God. That means you love God. That means that you think he let you down, but I promise you, I'm a living, breathing example. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will meet you where you're at. He will take you where you need to be. But even if you're his friend, he's going to test you. If you're not going through a test, if you're not going through a trial, you're not trying hard enough. How many ever heard new level, new devil? But the whole thing is God allows the enemy to come against us so we get stronger in our walk, stronger in our faith, stronger in our fight. How many are really ready to get strong? Come on, get strong. Fight that good fight of faith. Amen? So now, Sarah just says, you know what? Can you do me a favor? Can you just take Hagar and, 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 and uh, Ishmael outside into the wilderness because they're not welcome here anymore. And here's Hagar, and she's crying. She's in pain. And Abraham, he has to sneak out, you know, 
because he was thinking maybe Sarah was real close. And he didn't want to be disobedient to Sarah, but he still wanted to give provisions to Hagar. And he gave what he had. But Hagar was crying because she thought, we're going to perish. We're not going to make it. We're not going to have enough water. We're not going to have enough food. And the angel of the Lord came and just appeared and said, do not cry because God has seen your tears and he will provide for you. And he will be a father of many nations. Amen. So now, Abraham's thinking, I did a good deed. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a good night's sleep. How many think that sometimes we're just going to get a good night's sleep and then all of a sudden we get a call. All of a sudden somebody is sick. Somebody's in the hospital. Somebody, somebody just passed away. Somebody has a, an incurable disease. How many know that when we get that call, we can't just rely on ourselves. We can't lean on our own understanding. The Bible says do not lean on your own understanding, but to acknowledge him in all of your ways, and he will direct your path. How many know that we just need to get down on our knees and say, Lord, I can't do this without you. I need you to go before me. I need you to speak through me. I need you to be the light where I stand, the lamp of the word onto my feet. I need you to make every crooked path straight. How many have ever prayed that prayer before? I can't do this without you. But that's not the wake-up call he got. Abraham. 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 Take your son, your only son, the one whom you love, and offer him up as a sacrifice. How many, honestly, would be willing to answer that call? That's where the rubber hit the road. That was 911 critical stat. That's when your faith is going to be tested. Faith over fear. I don't know if I had that kind of faith. I don't know if I could wake up and just say, okay, God, let me just take my firstborn and let me just sacrifice him in the morning. But Abraham was obedient. And he woke up. And he woke up his son. And he took two servants. And they went and they walked. And I know that had to be a long, long, hard, cold, sad walk. And I imagine that Abraham was like, why, God, you told me I was going to have all the stars in the sky and the sea and all the sand on the seashore. And you want me to give up my first born. Don't you know that brought joy, that brought laughter, that brought happiness, that brought unity, that brought peace. We called him Isaac, which means laughter. And right when they got to the foot of Mount Moriah, Abraham looked to his servants and he said, you go back and we will be back later. How's that kind of how many want that kind of faith? I know I'm going through it. I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. I don't think I can make it through the storm. I don't think I can live another day. I think my prayers are hitting the roof. They're not being answered. My prayers are being denied. No, they're not. They're being delayed because God will give you what you need, not what you want. And all of a sudden, he looks to Isaac, and Isaac, I can't even imagine what he was thinking, but Isaac knew that his father loved God, God loved his father, and Isaac loved his father, and Isaac loved God. And Isaac said, Papa, I see the animal. I see the knife. I see the rope. I see the wood. But where's the sacrifice? Abraham looked to his son and said, God will provide. How many know that God is a God of provision? That he will provide. Even in our darkest, most loneliest, most, most troubling times, that he sees our tears, that he hears our prayers, and no matter what, he's always there. Just a little bit further. Just step a little bit closer. Just hear my voice. And now, Isaac carries the wood. And he lays down on the altar. And 
I can just imagine the tears that fell from Abraham's eyes as he thought about this is the moment of truth. This is where my faith will be tested. This is where my obedience will be tested. I don't know how I can do this. I can barely have enough power to raise the knife up and look at my son and know that I'm going to slay him. Where are you, God? And just as he comes down, he gets a stay of execution from heaven, from the angel of the Lord. Mercy and compassion, forgiveness and love. Abraham, do not harm your child, for you have proven your faith. You have shown yourself to be obedient. There is a ram caught in the thicket by the thorns. That is your sacrifice. Can you imagine how he felt? God showed up. God was obedient. God kept his truth. God is not one to lie. God said, no, you cannot do that. Not on my watch. You proved yourself. You came far enough. I heard your prayers. I saw your tears. You are with me. You are my child. I knew you from the foundations of this world. But I needed to see if you were going to be obedient. And I needed the world to see. How much you love me. Now you think about this. I want to show you some parallels between what Jesus was about to do a thousand, two thousand years into the future when Jesus was going to go to the cross. See, Jesus said, Take this cup from me three times. Abraham was told, you're going to have all the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore three times. But Jesus never heard from his father. He never got a stay of execution. 33 years old, defeated sin and death. Was tempted beyond anything we've ever been tempted. Sweaty drops of blood. But he never heard from the Father. See, when I think ministry is hard, when I can't do it anymore, when I can't preach another sermon, when I can't do another outreach, when I just can't wake up anymore, I know what Jesus did pales in comparison to what we will ever do as a minister, what we will ever do as a pastor, what we will ever do as an evangelist, what we will ever do as a chaplain, what we will ever do as a son or a daughter of God. All we got to do is look at what Jesus did for us. And some of the parallels is the father leads his son to be sacrificed. A donkey is involved in the road to sacrifice. To get from where they are to the place of sacrifice required a journey like Jesus going up the mountain of Golgotha. The sacrifice takes place on the same mountain called Moriah which was the Mount of Calvary, which became Golgotha. And it was Jesus with a crown of thorns on his head, just like when the ram was caught with a crown of thorns. But the ram was sacrificed in the place of the child. But Jesus was sacrificed in all of our places. By his stripes we are healed. By his iniquities, by our iniquities we are free. Now, I want you to all stand where you're at. Because I promise you, God has a purpose and a plan for each and every one of you. We are all called out of the darkness into his marvelous light. We are a royal priesthood. And you have to have that intimacy. And you have to have that faith. And you have to have that obedience. Now, Jesus is on the cross. One thief to the left is mocking him. If you're truly the Son of Man, then get off that cross and save yourself and save me too. The worship team can come up. The other thief was, no, quit mocking him. He's a perfect spot. Let's blame his lamb. 
that taketh away the sins of the world. He's Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh. He's the bright and morning star. Father, remember me when you enter to your Father's house. Say that with me. Father, remember me when you enter to your Father's house. He said, today you will be with me in my Father's house in paradise. And then he looked to Mary, his earthly mother. He said, Mary, this is your son to Jonathan. Jonathan, the disciple, this is your mother. The united family. Even when he was on the cross. Then the centurions came back to see who had expired and who was still alive. Because in those days, even though they had nails through their wrists and through their, their ankles and were fixating on their own blood. When they came back, they wanted to see if somebody was still breathing so they could break their legs. And then they would hang. And when they came back, the thief on the left and the thief on the right were still alive. But Jesus, he had already expired. And they laughed at him. Look at the Son of God, God's Word in flesh, King of the Jews. He's dead and these thieves are still alive. How clueless can we be? And then they broke their legs. Now there's a reason why they didn't break the legs of Jesus. It's because Isaiah had said not one bone would be broken of the perfect, spotless, blameless, lamb-fulfilling prophecy. The Bible is real from Genesis to Revelation. We read, we receive, we believe, and then we lead. Amen. They take the spear and they put it through the side of Jesus, his dead body. And they pull it out and there's blood and there's water. Water representing the new birth. And blood representing the transformative, powerful blood that one drop can heal this world. And one day we'll see him coming in the cloud of glory with a billion and billion of angels. And they said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter to the gates of joy, rest, and peace. But my question to you is, before we go into our prayer, why? Why was Jesus expired when the two thieves were still alive? So the two thieves' lives were taken. How many things have we had taken from us? Peace. Joy, laughter, faith, taken because we were not obedient to what we are chosen to do. Each and every one of you are chosen for such a time as this, in this season, to break the generational curses of your own family. Mine just happened to be murder, molestation, child abuse, drug addiction, alcoholism, and witchcraft. No, but Jesus' life was given. Father, why have you forsaken me? Please forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. It is finished. I put my hands, my heart, and my soul, and my spirit into your hands, Father, even though I never heard from you. What kind of faith is that? That's the kind of faith I want. Amen. How many want that kind of faith? That kind of obedience? Let's get on fire, church, because it's time to ignite the spark of revival. It doesn't matter where you are. It matters who you're with. Let's have the faith of Abraham. Let's be a father or mother of our own nation. With every eye closed and every Repeat this simple prayer with me. If you have never given your life to Christ before, the Bible says that if you do not confess me in front of man, I will not confess you in front of the Father. So it's serious. Maybe we did it, but we we're holding on to unforgiveness. Maybe we were doing it because of peer pressure. But for whatever reason, if that's you, with every eye closed and every head bowed, this is your opportunity to come forward. Just raise your hand so I can see it. Every eye closed and every I see that hand. Every eye closed, I see that hand. I see that hand. Amen, amen. Remember, you're not being arrested. You're being rescued. Amen. 
And if you just want to rededicate your life, you just want to come forward and say, you know what, I know I'm a sinner. I promise you there's prayer warriors that will be standing up here right by the worship team. They'll be more than happy to pray for you. And let's just all say this simple prayer and say it with unforgiveness. In other words, forgive everyone for everything and more importantly, forgive yourself of everything. And say this simple prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I am in desperate need of the risen Savior. And with the light that I've been given and the truth that I know, I'm ready to confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is real. That Jesus rose from the grave and he's coming back soon to bring me home. In your wonderful, precious, and matchless name, in the name of the only begotten Son and the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Let's give a big hand to Pastor David Nico Hill. What a fiery message. He just really unloaded a great word. And I just wanted to give you a thought because we're going to, you know, uh, dismiss here in just a minute you know Jesus didn't have to have his legs broken because he already bled out that's really what happened he bled out they knew he was dead and of course they they speared him just to make sure and of course the water came out as well as the blood as David said do you think about that because of the scourging the 39 lashes that he took with the whip that was made by the Romans to be able to create maximum damage and torture they'd use this to try to get confessions out of people to be able to get information out of people so <clears throat> bones and, and metal and teeth and all sorts of sharp jagged objects were used in the cat of nine tails and when Jesus was whipped that 39 times he was so weak he couldn't carry his own cross that was only part of the cross it was a cross beam he couldn't carry it by the time he got to the cross, he only lasted for a few hours. That's it. Because he bled out for you, and he bled out for me. I don't know about you, but that, that really touched me here today and a lot of other things. So today, uh, I want to just encourage you, if you or someone you know is dealing with addictions in your life, drugs, alcohol, sex, I don't know. I mean, gambling, there's all sorts of different addictions. If you're dealing with addictions, if you're dealing with hurts, hang-ups, habits in your life. Be here on Friday night. Pastor David is here each Friday night, 7 o'clock to, they're done by 9, sometimes before 9 o'clock. Great two hours. I come once a month just to be able to keep myself fresh and be able to minister to people because I've, I've come out of that life and I understand what it's like to be addicted. And I want to encourage you to get here yourself if that's situations that you're facing or to bring somebody else, you know, send them because it's a tremendous ministry. Let's give him a big hand for all that he's doing to help 50 or so people. I mean, that's a big group here. 50 or so people every Friday night, 7 o'clock. Don't forget to get your tickets. If you've got kids, grandkids, or rent kids, you know, for one day on December the 18th, get your tickets today uh, for the Breakfast with Santa. God bless you. Have a Jesus-filled day.